and screen share is starting now. Okay, um, last time we wrapped up talking about cartilage at the tissue level and, oops, sorry, um, covered the distinction between stress and strain, and I didn't list force here, but force as well in uh, relation to damage and failure of uh, tissues like cartilage. And take home there was, generally speaking, if you want to pick just one variable um, in terms of uh, quantifying the mechanics of cyclical loading that might cause an injury in a tissue like cartilage, um, which mechanics variable should you pick if you can just pick one hypothetically. Uh, strain is generally the best indicator of uh, risk for damage and failure of a tissue like uh, cartilage or any musculoskeletal tissue really uh, when it's being cyclically and repeatedly uh, loaded. Um, if you can't know strain for whatever reason, you'd probably pick stress because it's stre uh, the more stress, generally the more strain. And then a distant third would be the, the load that's causing the stress and the strain. So the load is kind of the driver of the whole thing. Without the load, there's no stress and no strain. Um, but just because a load is high doesn't necessarily mean there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of strain. So if you're going to pick or if you're going to rank order, you know, which ones are the best indicators of injury, uh, stress, number one, or sorry, strain, number one, stress, number two, and uh, load or force, a distant, number three. Um, talked about two key features of cartilage at the tissue level that make it really good at sustaining uh, these really heavy cyclical compressive loads uh, without getting injured. Those were the uh, structure and orientation of the collagen fibers where they're parallel at the surface, uh, meaning that when you compress that surface, you can get big compressive strains without uh, a lot of uh, strains that, that end up uh, pulling the, those collagen fibers and, and possibly tearing them. Um, other big piece of cartilage there that helps it be really good at sustaining uh, compressive loads without a lot of damage in a healthy state uh, was its biphasic poroviscoelastic nature. And that's a fancy way of saying cartilage has a lot of fluid in it, um, specifically synovial fluid. And under a normal healthy state, that synovial fluid can absorb a lot of the strain uh, that the cartilage experiences and keep that strain off the collagen fibers, off the solid piece of cartilage. Uh, which is the one that gets damaged and injured in, in things like osteoarthritis. Okay, um, we are at an important crossroads here in class. We are entering our uh, final uh, section here in terms of the scale of investigation of the body. We're moving down to the uh, cellular slash molecular level. And because we just finished talking about cartilage at the tissue level, we'll start um, our cellular molecular level here also talking about cartilage so that we get cartilage uh, all here at once. Um, if you're wondering what we're doing for the rest of the semester, because there's still a month left, are we spending a month on uh, cellular molecular biomechanics? We're not. Um, I think only the next three or maybe four lectures, I'm, I'm going off memory here, I don't have the schedule in front of me, um, but I think the next three or so uh, lectures are on the cellular level here, cellular biomechanics. Um, and then after that, we will do kind of a grab bag of some uh, applications of biomechanics that, that cross multiple scales and just kind of wrap up with uh, some interesting kind of general topics or uses for biomechanics uh, in kinesiology. But today, the cellular level. So it started at the whole body level, considering mostly the center of mass and forces applied to the whole body. Uh, then talked about how our limbs, the mechanics of our limbs, like the legs, affect motion of the center of mass. Um, and talked about the joints that comprise our limbs and how motion and rotation and kinetics of, of joints uh, cause our, our whole limbs to behave in certain ways or to appear to behave in certain ways. Joints are constructed of a whole bunch of tissues, namely cartilage and, and uh, bones and muscles and things like that. And what are tissues made of? Well, they're made of, depending on the scale of what you're looking at, tissues can be talked about as being made up of a lot of things, but the next level down here in terms of the smaller scale would typically be the cellular level. And you might immediately think, what, did, what does the cellular level or the molecular level have to do with physics and with mechanics, right? You know, biochemistry, if you're taking biochem classes or chemistry classes, you don't really talk about a whole lot of mechanics a lot of the time. Um, there's indeed a great deal of mechanics that goes on uh, at the cellular level. And I'm, I'm biased here because I like biomechanics and I, I like to think of biomechanics as the central science. And it's not really, I might think that it is, but that's just my subjective opinion. Um, but physics, you can very much argue uh, is the central science in terms of being able to explain uh, the interaction between uh, different 
parts of organisms or different parts of matter and different parts of things that just exist in the universe in terms of explaining how, how those things interact and why they behave in certain ways. And that extends to um, all of these scales of investigation that we've talked about here. So there is indeed a great deal of uh, mechanics at the cellular level. And when we talk about things that are alive at the cellular level, a great deal of biomechanics at the cellular level. Now let's just take a look for the, the, the scales of kind of structure of living biological systems here, just to kind of frame uh, what we're looking at here. Um, we can have the largest scale that we typically investigate biomechanics at, at the organism level, like a whole human body or a whole animal body. And we can even think of scales that go above and beyond this, like uh, societies or ecosystems. And those again may seem like something that doesn't have a great deal to do with mechanics, but you know, so you guys have probably moved at some point in your life and have probably gotten your friends to help you uh, carry a couch or a heavy TV or something like that. I, I guess TVs don't need a lot of help anymore. When I was in college, TVs weighed like a hundred pounds and so you usually couldn't lift it yourself. Um, but if you've ever carried something heavy with another person, you know, multiple people interacting with to, to achieve a certain goal, there's a great deal of mechanics involved in that. So we could even consider a higher scale here than the organism level. Um, but then organisms are constructed of organs or chunks or groups of tissues like liver or like cartilage is a tissue. Um, those organs and tissues are made of cells, such as uh, the chondrocytes that we talked about briefly last time in cartilage and that we'll talk about in some more detail today. Um, below the cellular level is the molecular level, such as the proteins that chondrocytes uh, interact with. Um, molecules are made of atoms, and this is your periodic table, hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon, that sort of stuff. Um, atoms are made of subatomic particles, protons, electrons, neutrons primarily. And subatomic particles are made of quarks, which I don't really know much about. I didn't get that far in, in physics, but I do know that subatomic particles are, are constructed of quarks. Um, what are quarks constructed of? Uh, as far as I know, nothing yet. A quark is the smallest uh, piece of life physically that physicists have come up with yet. And extending this scale down to smaller and smaller levels is a, a longstanding and common uh, question in research in physics, trying to understand What's, what, is, what is life made of? What, are ma what is matter made of? What are, what are the living things and even the inorganic things that comprise our, our universe and our world here? What are they made of? What's the smallest building block? Like if you, if you played with Legos when you were little, I played with a lot of Legos when I was little. Maybe you guys are too, maybe this is a generational thing. I don't know if Legos are around anymore, but I played with a lot of Legos. And there's the smallest Lego, right? The single piece. That's, that's the smallest thing that you can build stuff out of Legos from. Um, we haven't yet discovered in physics what's the smallest thing that matter is made of or what's the smallest thing that, that life is made of. But quarks are the smallest thing that we know about so far. Um, we will stop here at the cellular molecular level. We won't go too much deeper into these uh, other levels, largely because my expertise ends pretty much at the cellular and the molecular level. Um, this is one of my favorite sections of this class, largely because I think it's the one that I uh, personally know the least about. And that's, that's kind of how it goes in science. You get excited about uh, learning about new things. And so this, this is some fun stuff for me to, to put together because I actually learned quite a bit uh, putting these cellular uh, molecular uh, level lectures together and hopefully you will too. So what does the cellular molecular level look like? If you've taken a chemistry class or a biochemistry class, um, you may not have seen this drawing specifically. This is a, a drawing of a, a type two collagen uh, molecule, but you've probably seen drawings like this before in terms of how we typically draw uh, what molecules look like or drawings of molecules in chemistry and biochemistry textbooks and things like this. Um, so we have a lot of atoms here. There's some oxygen, there's some hydrogen, there's some nitrogen. Um, I don't really see anything else here. So collagen just from this drawing is primarily oxygen and hydrogen and nitrogen. Um, this kind of stop sign looking thing down here, when you see drawings like that, in, uh, in uh, molecular drawings like this, when you see these little stop sign looking things, uh, those are carbons or chains of carbons. So even though it doesn't say C down there, that's a, a carbon group that's attached to this collagen molecule. So molecules, again, just backing up the, the scale from the previous slide, are groups of atoms that are connected to each other, groups of hydrogen, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon atoms in this case that are connected to each other that together uh, form a, a functional unit known as the, the collagen molecule here. Um, you can see this is a type two collagen molecule. What does that mean exactly? Um, I won't get into too many details there, but there's lots of different types of uh, collagen in the body. It's actually a very abundant uh, type of, of, uh, of material that's in the body and lots of different types of it. Um, the collagen that comprises your 
uh, joints, your cartilage, for example, is very different from the collagen that comprises your skin and is different from the collagen that comprises your tendons and is different from the collagen that like a, uh, like a shark skeleton is made out of. So lots of different types of collagen uh, in the body here. This is specifically the, the type of collagen that's typically found in, in uh, human cartilage and human joints here. Now, what does this have to do with mechanics? Um, this actually has a lot to do with mechanics. You see these little lines here, and you probably learned in uh, chemistry, if you took a chemistry class, that these little lines are chemical bonds. Okay? They're what uh, connect these molecules to, to, together to each other and what kind of keep this whole thing, uh, sorry, connect these atoms together and what keep this whole thing kind of grouped together defined as a, a molecule with these little bonds or these lines uh, connecting these atoms here. Um, those bonds, what are they? Um, they're not like a, a physical like bridge, like a, a piece of matter or, or mass that connects them to each other. Um, but even if they were that, they would involve some mechanics. Um, but what they are is they are forces, forces of attraction holding these uh, atoms together or, or keeping them in, in close proximity to each other such that they comprise a functional unit of a molecule here. Okay? So that's where the physics and the mechanics comes in here. These are um, different atoms that are connected to each other by forces of attraction. And uh, in your chemistry classes, when you learned about like ionic bonds and covalent bonds and polar covalent bonds and all that stuff, um, that's what these connections are. That's what those types of forces are. Um, typically, the forces that connect these atoms here in these molecules are electrostatic forces, forces between uh, uh, atoms with different charges and different numbers of electrons. Um, sometimes I believe they're from these atoms like uh, sharing an electron that like goes back and forth uh, between them and, and generates different uh, forces because of, of that transfer of that electron. But generally speaking, you can think of these atoms being held together uh, by, by uh, forces that bond them to each other and then uh, bonding certain groups of these atoms together to form a molecule here. And depending on uh, what types of atoms are bonded together and how strongly they're bonded together, we can get uh, different functional units or different molecules here that behave mechanically in different ways. So what does that have to do with biomechanics? Well, I just explained what it has to do with biomechanics. But just another example here about how there's biomechanics that appear in elements of kinesiology and elements of biochemistry that you may not initially recognize as biomechanics. And so similar to how we talked about how uh, you can think of math as just a language for describing how things work, like I could describe to you in English how my elbow muscles work, or I could describe to you in math how my elbow muscles work. Um, you can also think of biochemistry and biomechanics as just two lenses through which you can view the same thing, or two different languages through which you can describe the same thing. Um, these, these graphics and these equations here don't have anything uh, explicitly to do with collagen. This is the uh, cross bridge cycle here for, uh, for force production, for active force production in muscles. So this is just an example of, of linking biochemistry and biomechanics. This is a bit of a departure uh, from the collagen focus today. But these are the chemical reactions here on the left, the, the biochemical perspective on the cross bridge cycle involving the forming and breaking of uh, bonds in these molecules and different uh, molecules moving around and in, in different places and release of energy and these sorts of things and uh, ATP becoming ADP and ATP hydrolysis and all of these things, all the things that you learn about in biochemistry when you talk about how muscle produces force. Okay? Um, shown on the right here is the biomechanics lens or the biomechanics view of these same equations. Okay? This is basically these different steps in the cross bridge cycle written out here on the left in the language of biochemistry, but shown graphically or animated here in the language of biomechanics, where I have this uh, head on the myosin protein here, and that head attaches to this actin filament in step two here. Um, that develops a little bit of tension, that attachment develops a little bit of tension or basically pulls on that myosin head, sorry. Um, to relieve that tension, the myosin head rotates or moves to the left here. So think about a, a spring and then you release the tension in that spring, it would move uh, to the left. Um, it then detaches and the ATP comes in and attaches to it and causes it to recock or move back to its original position and get ready to do that cycle again. Okay? So two ways of describing basically the same thing or in, in this case, exactly the same thing, um, the cross bridge cycle from the language of biochemistry and the cross bridge cycle from the language of biomechanics. And I would argue that we can't look at just one of these and have the full picture for how this works. The biochemistry here is missing the force and the work. 
and the biomechanics over here is missing the biochemistry. So really to get the full picture of what's going on, we need to include both of these things. Okay, back to cartilage. Um, what is cartilage or what's, what's kind of our view here on what cartilage is at the cellular uh, slash molecular level? We talked about it already at the tissue level, but now we're going down to a smaller scale. So what's it look like at the cellular molecular level? What's it made of at that level and what do those pieces that it's made of do? Um, at the cellular slash molecular level, um, cartilage, if you take just any kind of arbitrary chunk of cartilage out of a joint of the body, um, it's going to consist, again, at a, of a solid phase and a fluid phase. And when we think of cartilage of, as being a solid phase and a fluid phase, there we're typically still at a, at a tissue level, at a macroscopic level of investigation or level, level of scale. Um, that solid phase, um, which is the extracellular matrix, is about 20% of the mass of cartilage. And that fluid phase, which is the, the interstitial fluid or the liquid part that's, that's kind of surrounds that, that solid matrix is about 80% of the mass of cartilage. So most of cartilage in terms of its mass is actually fluid. It doesn't have that much solid mass to it. Now, what is that solid mass made of? That's where the cellular molecular level becomes interesting. Um, about 60% of that solid mass is the collagen uh, molecule. Um, which is what gives the cartilage its, its stiffness and its elasticity and its general kind of spring-like behavior. Um, about another 15% of that 20% is proteoglycans, which are proteins that affect the uh, general function of, of, the, uh, of, of the solid part of the cartilage. Um, there's lots of different proteoglycans in cartilage. I'm only listing a couple here that are particularly important. Um, there's agrican, which is helpful for connecting the solid phase and this fluid phase. Um, agrican helps bind the fluid to the solid and gives the cartilage a lot of its uh, damping behavior, its energy absorbing behavior, and its, its viscosity. Um, lubricin, as you might guess from the name, is another proteoglycan that's, that's in the solid uh, part of cartilage here. And as you might guess from the name, it's important for lubrication. It's what keeps uh, the surface of, college, uh, of, uh, of cartilage uh, very slick and slippery and allows joints to, to move with very low friction because the cartilage uh, slides past the cartilage on the other side of the joint uh, very easily, as long as there's a lot of lubricin in there. Okay, you take 60 and you add 15 and you only get 75. Um, you have some other proteins in there and you add those and you get to 90%. And what do those other proteins do? We don't know. We don't really understand what cartilage, how cartilage functions all that well. These are open topics in terms of uh, understanding what all of these things that cartilage are made of do. Um, if you add all these up, you might notice it only adds to 90%. So there's another 10% uh, of this 20% mass that's composed of something, and we don't really know exactly what it does. So these are just the, the things that we have a pretty good understanding of uh, what cartilage is made of and, and what those things do and why they're important. Um, the fluid phase here, which is again, most of the mass of cartilage is interstitial fluid, which is a fancy way of saying it's the fluid that kind of permeates and surrounds these, uh, this solid phase, this solid matrix up here. Um, in a healthy state, that fluid consists mostly of water, of course, and also uh, nutrients suspended in that water, sodium, calcium, potassium, um, same stuff that's, I don't know if there's any calcium in Gatorade, but certainly sodium and potassium in, in sports beverages. And these are nutrients that cartilage needs to be uh, healthy, to regulate its, its healthy metabolism via chondrocytes, which we'll talk about later today. Um, in a diseased state, like in an osteoarthritic joint, if you look at this interstitial fluid, um, you'll see some nutrients still, maybe not as many nutrients. And you'll also see some of this other stuff. You'll see uh, proteins in the interstitial fluid. You'll see collagen proteins. You'll see proteoglycans. Um, that's generally a bad thing because that's not where we want those proteins. For the proteins to be uh, healthy and effective and functional, they need to be in this solid phase, not in this fluid phase. Okay, so that's a sign of disease in, in cartilage, where if you take like a sample of uh, interstitial fluid and you see that there's substantial, more, like more than trace amounts of actual collagen and proteoglycans in it, uh, that's a bad sign. That's probably some unhealthy cartilage there. But in a healthy state, it has lots of good stuff in it that's necessary for, for the, the regulating the health of cartilage. Now, this fluid binding and, and ability to have fluid flow in and out of the, the, the permeable solid part of cartilage, we talked about that last time, and that's a really important element of cartilage. 
And so let's dive into this, this part of cartilage here and this, this role of agrican in binding fluid to the extracellular matrix and regulating fluid flow in and out of the cartilage a little bit deeper and see if we can understand that uh, a little bit better at the cellular slash molecular level here. Um, agrican are these kind of funky looking purple and, and green things here in this drawing. If it's not obvious what you're looking at here, um, these kind of yellow and white shaped lines here would be parts of the solid phase of cartilage, the extracellular matrix. And then in and around that extracellular matrix would be this, this fluid phase, this kind of light blue looking stuff. Okay? Um, the agrican here helps bind that solid phase and that fluid phase together. So it helps keep the fluid phase kind of embedded and in parallel with the uh, solid phase here. Okay? Um, it also, if you have a substantial agrican here, also helps uh, regulate the function of that permeable nature of collagen that we talked about last time. And that this, this membrane here, this uh, solid matrix membrane here is permeable to this water. Meaning when you squish it, some of the water goes out. Like if you load it and compress it, that squishes out some of that water. And when you release that load, then the load is gone and it sucks some water back up into it. Okay? Um, that cycling of the fluid in and out of the cartilage, in and out of the collagen matrix here, is really, really important. Because remember that fluid is where the nutrients are. And so it'll bring in some fluid and the metabolism of the cartilage will use those nutrients up. And then you need to get rid of that used up fluid and bring in new nutrient rich fluid that's outside of the collagen matrix here. Um, me mechanical loading is the means for doing that. But the reason mechanical loading is able to do that is because you have a lot of healthy functional agrican inside here that's uh, giving it that permeable nature and that's binding that fluid to the collagen matrix once it's inside of there and delivering those nutrients to the collagen. Okay, so all of these pieces here of, uh, of cartilage, I have just some solid, some solid pieces highlighted here, but they kind of work in, in a context with the solid phase and the fluid phase. Um, all of them kind of add up here to give cartilage its uh, kind of macroscopic level function in terms of its uh, stiffness, its storage and return of energy and its damping, its ability to absorb energy and its ability to uh, regulate its, its stiffness when it's loaded quickly, like we talked about last time with the, uh, the speed bump example. Now, how does it do that exactly? How and specifically does the fluid amount or the amount of fluid in water that's bound there by, or sorry, the amount of fluid in collagen that's bound there by that agrican, um, how does that specifically affect the mechanics of the collagen? And how does that help the cartilage uh, become stiffer when it's loaded faster and undergo uh, less, strain, less strain for a given stress when it's, when it's loaded faster? Um, the simple mechanical model is supposed to be simple. If you're seeing it for the first time, it may not look so simple. But the simple or simplest mechanical model for quantifying that thing and for representing that, that function of the fluid in cartilage regulating the stiffness and the strain response of cartilage is this model right here. Um, this is called a spring damper model. Um, it consists of two simple mechanical elements that are in parallel with each other, or side to side with each other. You've got a spring over here. And then you've got what's known as a dash pot over here, this kind of pot looking thing with a, a T looking thing sitting in it kind of looks like a piston and it kind of behaves like a piston in your car if you're familiar with how pistons uh, work in automobiles. That's, that's why it looks like this. But it's a spring that's in series with the dash pot over there. Uh, Emily says she's having trouble hearing me. Is anyone else having trouble hearing me? No, I can hear you. Okay, thanks. Sorry, sorry, Emily. It might might be on your end, but it seems like it's sounding okay on my end here. Okay, so if we want to think of a, a simple mechanical model of not of cartilage at the cellular level, but of how the things that cartilage is composed of at the cellular level um, give it its its characteristic mechanical function, this spring damper model or spring dash pot model is is a simple model for doing that. Um, the force arrow here is actually drawn in, in the wrong direction. You should think of it as being pointed downward here, a, a compressive force that's, that's placed on the cartilage. So think of a force being placed on it here and then squishing this whole apparatus downward like that. So this spring would compress and this dash pot or this damper here would compress. Now, mathematically, 
that deformation, the amount of squish X in this model here, when you squish it with a certain force F would look like this. You would apply a force to it and the amount of force that you apply to it would give you this deformation X and this rate of deformation here, DX DT. Okay. Um, an easier way or the, the way, the easier way that I like to wrap my mind around this is that you deform the cartilage by a certain amount X and you deform it by that amount at a certain rate of deformation DX DT. Okay. So the bigger X is here, the more you're squishing the thing. Okay. This would be a tiny X, this would be a big X. Um, dx dt here, that's the rate of deformation. Okay. Here I'm squishing it slowly. Here I'm squishing it fast. Okay. This would have a low or a slow value for dx dt. This would have a fast or a big value for dx dt. Okay. And depending on how much overall you deform it by and how quickly you deform it by, that will cause a certain force or a certain contact force to be sustained or carried by that, that piece of cartilage. Okay. Now, the important parameters here are this parameter K, which is the stiffness of the cartilage, primarily the stiffness of the collagen, and this parameter B here, which is the, the damping rate or the damping constant, which is a function of, of uh, the, the aggregate in, in that uh, cartilage or in that collagen. Okay. Now, depending on how big B here is, which is largely going to be a function of how much water is, is in there inside that, that collagen, the faster that you deform the cartilage here, you're going to be multiplying that by a value B here, and then subtracting that number from this negative number over here, which is your stiffness times your amount of deformation. And what that's going to result in is that you will get a bigger force here or a larger compressive force on the cartilage when you're deforming it at a faster and faster rate here. Okay. Um, you could also think of this, sorry, you could also think of this as the faster that you try and load the cartilage here, the bigger the force you're going to need to deform it by a certain amount here because the faster you deform it here, the bigger this whole term is going to be, the more it's going to subtract from this already negative term here, and the bigger the force you're going to need here to get a certain deformation x here. Okay. Um, if all that math, kind of verbal math there doesn't make sense to you, the, the easy way to think about this is the faster you deform cartilage, the stiffer it's going to behave. Not because k here is somehow magically getting bigger when you deform it faster, but because this damping term here is increasing the amount of force that you're going to need to deform the cartilage by a certain amount. Okay? So when we talk about cartilage getting stiffer when you deform it faster, it's not really like mechanically, like material wise getting stiffer, like the collagen still has a certain stiffness and that doesn't change when you load it faster. But what does change is the faster you try and move that fluid out of the way, the stiffer it behaves and the more force you're going to need to deform that solid part of cartilage by a certain amount. Um, a good way you can demonstrate this for yourself is if you, not that we go to swimming pools a lot these days during the pandemic, but when the pandemic's over and you're at a swimming pool, um, stick your hand in the water and you'll see that if you move your hand slowly through the water, it doesn't resist you very much. It's very easy to move your hand slowly through the water. Okay? If you take your hand and try to move it fast through the water, that's more difficult, right? The water resists you more and more, the faster you try and move that water out of the way or the faster you try to slide your hand through the water. That's what you're seeing here with this effect. When you try to move it slowly through the water, that just takes a little force to move that water out of the way. When you try and move it fast through the water, that takes a big force. The water feels like it's stiffer. It, it functionally behaves like a stiffer material when you try to move it quickly or deform it quickly and get it quickly out of the way. So why does our cartilage uh, get stiffer when we load it faster? It doesn't really. The collagen itself keeps the same stiffness, but by trying to squeeze that water out of the cartilage faster, the water resists you more because of this damping term. And the whole cartilage itself, not specifically the collagen, but the whole cartilage itself uh, behaves like it's stiffer or seems like it's stiffer. You need a larger force to deform that cartilage by a certain amount because of its fluid content here and this uh, damping term in this model here.
And again, why is this? Well, it's because the agrican binds that fluid inside of the water there. And because this permeable membrane here uh, only lets some of the fluid squish out of the water. You can squeeze it. And if you squeeze it long enough with a big enough force, you'll squeeze all of it out. But there's a certain time course to it. You can't just instantly squeeze um, all of the water out. Some of it stays in there and, and, and resists the deformation there by loading up that water instead of loading up the, the solid phase of the cartilage there. So that, in a nutshell, is why car uh, cartilage is, uh, in a healthy state at least, has a large amount of water inside of it um, for biochemical reasons to deliver nutrients to it, but also for biomechanical reasons to help it reduce the amount of uh, strain that it gets imposed on this kind of uh, damage-prone solid phase when you're loading it with large loads and loading those loads quickly. Okay, notice here, we're supposed to be talking about the cellular level and we haven't actually talked about any cells yet. We talked a lot about the molecular level, but we haven't actually talked about the cellular level yet. Okay? Um, and this solid phase, notice that we referred to that as the extracellular matrix. Okay? So we're not actually talking about cells here. So let's wrap up here and talk about cells or actually cell, there's only one type of cell um, in cartilage. Um, this term here, extracellular, that means extra beyond cellular or basically non-cellular. Um, none of this collagen slash proteoglycan assembly here that comprises the solid phase of cartilage is cells. It's not cells, it's proteins and, and things like proteins. So what, what cells are in cartilage and what role do cells play in the mechanics of cartilage and the health of cartilage? Um, cartilage is actually fairly simple at the cellular level because like I said in the last lecture, it's only got one type of cell in it and that cell is chondrocytes. Um, this is a great example in science where we like to give things complex names that aren't really all that complicated. What is a chondrocyte exactly? Um, chondro is a synonym for cartilage. So whenever you see the term chondro in, in textbooks or in papers or wherever, if you see the term chondro, at least in relation to joints, in relation to, to biology and anatomy, uh, chondro means cartilage. Okay? And site, what does site mean? Site means cell. So what's the name of the cell in cartilage? It's the cell in cartilage, chondrocytes. Um, what do chondrocytes look like? They are these little dots over here. So these little nuclei and those little black things in the middle, and then this other kind of white stuff that surrounds the chondrocytes there. Um, and you can see just like the collagen fibers themselves had different arrangements and different orientations uh, depending on their depth in the cartilage, um, the chondrocytes also have different arrangements and different concentrations and different shapes um, depending on where you are in the cartilage here. Okay? Um, there's a lot of them and a lot of big ones kind of down towards the surface here. And they again kind of radiate out along the direction of these collagen fibers. Um, in the middle, they're a little bit flatter and there's not quite as many of them and they're kind of randomly oriented. And then at the top, there's a lot of them again and they're kind of flat and again, kind of flattened and oriented um, along the direction of the uh, collagen fibers here. So you might just look at this and see you know, some similarities between the shape and orientation of the chondrocytes and the orientation of the collagen fibers and think, oh, I, I kind of intuitively think that these chondrocytes might have something important to do or might have something important to say about these collagens over here. And they do, they have these things are very closely tied to each other. Um, you might also look at these kind of flat squished out looking chondrocytes up here and think, huh, maybe, maybe these superficial loads that we place on cartilage, which look like they're squishing these chondrocytes, maybe, that, maybe that's something we should think about. What, what, what role does, does compressive loading or what role does deforming these chondrocytes have on them? Is that a good thing for them? Is that a bad thing for them? These ones down here, they look more like I'm used to uh, seeing cells drawn, like these nice kind of spherical, healthy looking cells down here. So are, th are these good, healthy cells up here and these ones, these kind of flat squished out ones, these are in trouble or what's, what's going on here? Let's see if we can figure this out. Okay, this is what a chondrocyte looks like typically in a uh, chemistry focused uh, textbook drawing of chondrocyte. Um, don't worry about everything that's going on here. There's a great deal of stuff that's going on here. Um, key thing to keep in mind here is look at this funny looking kind of white and orange labeled strand here. Um, that is your collagen. Okay? And notice that your collagen here is coming out of your chondrocyte. Um, that is the key main and in many cases sole function of chondrocytes. They are responsible for the metabolism in cartilage. 
which is essentially the metabolism of the collagen matrix. Okay? Um, chondrocytes are responsible for uh, tearing down old damaged collagen or uh, catabolizing collagen and also for creating new, healthy, hopefully stronger collagen or anabolizing collagen. Okay? So key role for chondrocytes here is the metabolism of cartilage and specifically the metabolism of collagen, of regulating that solid matrix of cartilage without which we basically have no cartilage. So single cell in, car in cartilage here, but a really important cell responsible for basically maintaining the entirety of its mechanical integrity uh, via regulating the metabolism of uh, cartilage here, or of collagen here. Um, all these other little pieces here, you can see some, uh, some terms we've talked about in terms of agrican and things like that. Um, they're all related to more specifically how chondrocytes do that. Like how do they uh, secrete cartilage here and how, how do they secrete collagen here and how do they uh, identify and break down old damaged collagen. Uh, not really topics that I get into in this class, but that's what's, what's being shown here. So for the sake of this class, you can just kind of think of chondrocytes as being the cell uh, that's responsible for the metabolism, the, the, the creation and the breakdown of uh, collagen proteins inside the, the solid phase of cartilage there. So what do these things do? This is again, just in writing what I've just said here for when you're going back and studying. Um, chondrocytes role is they develop, maintain and repair the collagen and also the proteoglycans. Basically they're responsible for the entirety of that solid phase of, uh, of cartilage of the entire extracellular matrix. So primarily collagen, uh, but also for the proteoglycans that give uh, the collagen and, and the solid phase its, its function. Um, in adulthood, um, chondrocytes are responsible for regulating cartilage turnover, which is your balance between uh, anabolizing new collagen and uh, catabolizing old collagen. Um, the density of your chondrocytes is roughly 15,000 of them per uh, square millimeter of cartilage uh, from the ages of 20 to 30 or so. Um, with aging, then that deteriorates. The amount or the density of chondrocytes in your cartilage deteriorates as, as you get older and older uh, beyond age 20 or 30 or so. So the amount of chondrocytes that, that most of you who are, I'm guessing most of you in the class are in your early 20s or so, um, the amount of uh, chondrocytes that you have in your cartilage right now is probably about the peak that you're gonna have in your lifetime. You're certainly probably not gonna get any more as you go and you're probably gonna have less as, as you continue to age into your 30s um, and beyond. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't have any chondrocytes if we age too much or you get to age you know, 30 and suddenly your chondrocytes are gone. You still have some no matter how old your, your cartilage is, um, but we do have less as we age. And so it's not the case that as we age that we have no ability to create new collagen, but we do have a, a reduced or minimized ability to create new collagen as we age. <clears throat> um, there's also a uh, very limited capacity, sorry, <clears throat> Uh, very limited capacity as we age um, because of these losses of chondrocytes uh, to repair damage to collagen uh, and especially to repair uh, substantial damage like very large fissures and ruptures in the collagen um, as we age. But in a young healthy state, at least as, as young adults with, with lots of healthy cartilage and lots of chondrocytes uh, in them, um, we are indeed able to uh, use chondrocytes to uh, tear down old damaged collagen and replace it with new healthy collagen. And through some of that cartilage conditioning uh, business that we talked about in the last few lectures, um, ideally make our collagen stronger so that when we get to uh, age 30, 40, 50 and beyond, and we've lost much of our ability to uh, grow new collagen and repair damage to collagen, that we've got a lot, that we're starting from a high baseline of, of, of a good, good amount of strong, healthy collagen that will hopefully persist uh, for the rest of our life when we, when we don't have such a good ability to strengthen it and, and, and to repair it. Um, how does it do that? How do chondrocytes do that when, when we're young adults here? Um, long story short is mechanical loading. That is essentially the only way that chondrocytes get triggered to do their job, to say, hey, there's some damaged collagen here. I want you to break it down and some, some used up proteoglycans here. I want you to break those down and I want you to replace them with new, healthy, stronger ones. How does it do that? It's via mechanical loading. You can think of mechanical loading as the signal that triggers chondrocytes to do their job. Um, chondrocytes are coated in a, another proteoglycan or another protein called hyaluronin which does a lot of things. It's a, a protective shield for the chondrocyte, so it doesn't get damaged when it is squished. Um, what it does do when it's squished, because it's protected with this hyaluronin, 
um, it becomes mechanosensitive, which is a fancy word of saying it responds metabolically to deformation, to a mechanical signal. Um, the term that physiologists use here is upregulates. I just simply say increases a lot of the time. But when a chondrocyte gets mechanically loaded, like when you squish your cartilage, when you exercise or when you run or whatever, um, that squishing will cause a little bit of damage in the solid parts of your cartilage. But that squishing will also deform the chondrocytes in that solid part, which is the chondrocytes trigger to say, hey, there might be some damage here. Go check it out. See if there's a lot of damage. If there is, get rid of it and then upregulate your synthesis of new collagen and new proteoglycans here to replace that damaged stuff with stronger stuff. Um, the only way that, car, that uh, chondrocytes know to do that is from being deformed, from applying mechanical forces to them that deform them and trigger them to, to serve this role, to break down uh, old solid stuff and synthesize new, stronger, healthier solid stuff. Mechanical loading is not just uh, important for that, it's the, the sole source of chondrocytes doing that in the first place. Now, this is especially important for um, cartilage. This, th there are many cells in the body that behave this way. Chondrocytes are, are far from the only cell in the body that, that serve that role and behave that way and, and uh, regulate their metabolism in response to mechanical loading. But I would argue that they're the cell in the body where arguably that role is most important because remember cartilage is a little bit unique compared to most tissues in the body. Um, in a healthy state at least, it has very little if any uh, direct connection to the nervous system and very little if any direct connection to the circulatory system. Um, the nervous system is typically how we sense that something's wrong, right? Like if I go to my, my stove over there and turn on the stove and let it go for a while and stick my hand on it, it gets hot and I say, oh, it's hot, I pull my hand away. Um, that sensation of heat and pain triggers me to respond mechanically by pulling it away. Right? Um, cartilage has none of no such connections like that. Cartilage has nothing in it where the nervous system tells it, hey, you're, you're deforming me, you're damaging me, that's painful, stop doing that. Okay? It would be kind of like, suppose my hand uh, didn't have the, the, the skin surface of my hand, suppose it didn't have any connection to the nervous system. Suppose there was no uh, like, like connections in my, in my hand telling it that say heat is, is painful. Okay? I could turn on my stove and I could put my hand on it and I could just leave it there with you know, the smoke going everywhere. So I might look like Billy Badass while I'm doing that, but I would permanently damage my hand, right? I, I, it would be ruined beyond repair because I'm lacking that, that sensation of pain and that signal to, to stop doing this before I cause uh, permanent damage. So in cartilage, when it doesn't have that signal, having this mechanosensitivity, having these cells that respond positively to that deformation, to that mechanical signal and growing and repairing it from that damage is, is, is critical to its function, more so than, uh, than most cells which have these direct connections to the nervous system. Um, similar argument here for the circulatory system. Um, that's how a lot of tissues of the body like muscles get uh, nutrients delivered to them from the blood that, that's passed to them from the circulatory system. Cartilage again has no direct connection to the circulatory system. So even if it was able to sense damage with the nervous system, it has no means of directly getting the nutrients there. The mechanical loading and the permeability and the chondrocytes is the only way of getting it to, to use those nutrients. So cartilage is not normally connected to those things. And so I would argue that mechanical loading, which stimulates the metabolism of cartilage via chondrocytes deformation, is not just important for cartilage health, it's mandatory for cartilage health. Um, a great example of this is if you look at uh, some of the studies that NASA does on astronauts who go up into outer space and are there for months and aren't really loading the body heavily a lot. Um, they do do a lot, astronauts actually do a lot of exercise when they're up in, in low gravity environments, but no matter how much you do, you can't replace the mechanical loading of, of Earth gravity. You, 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 you generate much larger mechanical loads in the body um, exercising on Earth than you do uh, in zero gravity. So those astronauts come back to Earth and they haven't had gravitational loading for a long time. And typically you hear about the muscles and the bones atrophying, right? Um, in the absence of mechanical loading from gravity, everything atrophies. It's not just the muscles, it's not just the bones, it's the cartilage, it's the eyeballs, it's the tissues and organs inside the body. Everything kind of degrades in this absence of mechanical loading. So mechanical loading is important for the health of all tissues. Um, for cartilage, which has no way of regulating its health in the absence of mechanical loading, I would argue that it's mandatory, it's essential 
for the, the health of the cartilage. So loading cartilage, we don't, we don't want to think of loading joints as being a bad thing. That's often like the uh, popular press story you hear, right? Oh, don't, don't run too much, don't exercise too much or wear out your joints. That is possible, but generally speaking for normal amounts and intensities of exercise, that's good for the health of our joints. And I would say essential and mandatory for the health of our joints because of the stuff we, we talked about today. And that is it for today and it for, I forget what week this is, but I believe there's five more to go. So we are near the end and keep it up and we will see you next time. Thank you. You're welcome.